This week's journey begins with a tour through the King Center in Atlanta with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s older sister. In 1929, Atlanta's Auburn Avenue was a thriving center of black cultural and economic life. And it was in that year, and on this street, that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was born. Back then, no one could have predicted that a couple of blocks in this street would eventually become a national park, the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Site. We try to educate about the significance of that time period and the actual th happenings that were taking place that cried out for an individual like Martin Luther King. In the Visitor Center, a series of displays recounts the remarkable life and times of Martin Luther King Jr. Here, the old dilapidated wagon that was used to carry his casket down Auburn Avenue. The reason they wanted to find this wagon, a caisson, was because it symbolizes the poor. It's not a fancy wagon. Exactly. As Park Superintendent, Judy Forte oversees not just a museum or a building, but a living, breathing place, a neighborhood, a way to experience Dr. King not just as this larger-than-life historical figure, but as a human being. It's where he was born, lived, worked, and is now buried. This is the house where Dr. King was born in 1929 and lived the first 10 years of his life. We're gonna go in and take a look, and our tour guide is uniquely qualified to show us around. Is this pretty much how it was? Oh, yes. As Martin Luther King Jr.'s older sister, Dr. Christine King Ferris knew her kid brother in a way few others did. This picture over here, it was taken right after Christmas over by the windows. Martin is here. And, and that's A.D. So this is A.D. And this is my grandmother, Jenny Williams, and of course, Dad and Mom. And the room where the family would gather to play games. Chinese checkers. Monopoly, and Coach Martin was the star at Monopoly. He liked Monopoly? Yes. <laughs> it's very interesting because that was not an interest necessarily of his, but it was between he and my father. You remember what you listened to on the radio? Superman, things like that, Dick Tracy. That, Dick Tracy, <laughs> well, I think that was common, but Superman, they loved. <laughs> This was where all three of us were born. My dad tell that when my brother Martin came, he was so happy that it was a boy and said he jumped to the top of that ceiling and hit that. <laughs> the man we remember as the great civil rights leader was, to Dr. Ferris, a mischievous little brother who along with other brother, A.D., would wreak havoc with her dolls, as she was reminded when we took a look at her room. Don't have many dolls here because my brothers beheaded my dolls. Oh, that's sweet. They would throw the dolls and the head would come off or whatever. <laughs> Did you ever wish I wish my brothers were sisters? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but also more sobering moments, Moments that may have sparked the dream that Dr. King spoke of in his famous speech. Like the time their white playmates, children of the shop owner across the street, announced one day that they could no longer play with Martin and A.D. One day when they went out to play and they told them, uh, the boys told uh, my brothers that they couldn't play with them anymore because, you know, they were Negroes or something, or niggers or whatever, but they couldn't play with them. Of course, that was a sad moment. Do you remember Martin's and A.D.'s reaction to that? Oh, they were sad, very sad. But this house, for Dr. Ferris, seems to evoke more happy and funny memories than sad. We all had chores. My mother would assign some to do the dishwashing. And Martin would always say, well, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and so that's what we're... With a guide like Dr. Ferris, it's easy to forget that there's much more to this historic site than the birth home, like the restored firehouse just down the street, manned by all white firemen during King's youth, but later became one of the first integrated firehouses in the city. And of course, the church, Ebenezer Baptist. Dr. King was a reverend before he was doctor. So in order for us to tell the whole story of Dr. King, we have to start from this sanctuary, and this sanctuary is very important for us. Between his grandfather and father, 
Kings were pastors of this church for 81 years. Martin Jr. was co-pastor with his father from 1960 to 1968. It is where he gave his first sermon and his last, only two months before he died. They played back his prophetic words during his funeral, and visitors here can still hear them. We all think about it, and every now and then I think about my own death, and I think about my own funeral, and I don't think of it in a morbid sense. They played that tape. It's called The Drum Major Instinct. So that was pretty powerful. In fact, this whole historic site is pretty powerful when one considers how a couple of blocks of Auburn Avenue came to have such a profound impact on who we are today. Throughout the King home, reminders that this iconic historical figure was once just a child. Those were the, you know, the row houses, and we would go over and visit and play. From the back porch, you get a great view, not just of the backyard, but of a childhood that was as happy as it was normal. When they think of Martin Luther King, you know, they think of him as some icon, and uh, by coming here, then they would see, you know, how he grew up just like they grew up in a normal, you know, uh, family. He was just what I call a regular fella. <laughs> yeah. And I want young people to understand that. A regular fellow who from time to time could get into some regular trouble. The garage was over in that area. It had kind of an incline. One day, the boys somehow got a hold of Dad's keys. Oh, no. And uh, oh, no. <laughs> they didn't know how to drive, but they were trying. So they turned on the motor and that car went through the back of that garage. <laughs> and they were in trouble. It is the stuff of boyhood, and as it turned out, the stuff of dreams. Until next time, pleasant journey. I'll like Susie Q here. You wanna turn around for this one? All right, let's try it. Cameraman's over there. There we go, thank you. Okay. As you called, but, um, What's the word you use? Hold on. What's the word you use? What? You said something else over there. Um, uh, reclaim. Um, it wasn't reclaim. What was it? You're like. I don't know. It's in the moment. Okay, fine. A bit about the major leagues first. Why do I keep doing that? Let me tell you a little bit about the major leagues first. What? What? What are some of the fun things you like doing here at the baseball game when you come? Eating hot dogs. Eating That's hot dogs. Good. What about singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game? Yeah. Well, let me hear you sing it. Take me out to the ball game. That's all I know. <laughs> Georgia Traveler is produced in partnership with the Georgia Department of Economic Development. This is a GPB original production.